Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher from Georgia State University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean at Temple University, C. Sheng at the Ohio State University, and Justin White at the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will drop from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Sheng at the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our fall 2021 season with a grand rounds presentation by Dr. Nancy Rigotti entitled Le Leveraging Hospitalization to Promote Smoking Cessation in Clinical Training Settings. Dr. Rigotti is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of Massachusetts General Hospital's Tobacco Research and Treatment Center. Trained as a general internist, Dr. Rigotti has served as president of the Society of General Internal Medicine and president of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. She's internationally known for her research to develop, test, and disseminate tobacco cessation treatments across a variety of healthcare settings. Dr. Rigotti was a member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine panel that produced the 2018 report, Public Health Consequences of E-Cigarettes, and the scientific co-editor of the 25th Anniversary U.S. Surgeon General's report. She has published over 350 peer-reviewed papers and received numerous grants to support her work from NIH and foundations. Our discussion today is Dr. Catherine McLean. Dr. Rigaldi will answer all the questions at the end of her presentation. Dr. Rigaldi, thank you for presenting for us today. Please take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to speak at this uh, at this conference. Um, so uh, let's let's get going. So the topic here is I entitled "Leveraging Hospitalization to Promote Smoking Cessation in Clinical Settings." But actually, I realized this is a policy research seminar, so I actually should retitle it as "Leveraging Tobacco Control Policy to Promote S Smoking Cessation in Clinical Settings." And I'll show you why that's the case in a moment. But first, here are my disclosures. Um, I guess the most important is that I don't receive any funding from an e-cigarette or tobacco manufacturers. And the work that I'm going to present today has been funded by NIH and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, so what I want to do is, is take you, so here's the new title, um, just to make everyone feel more at home. Um, and let me show you what I mean by tobacco control policy uh, or what a, the specific policy I'm talking about. Uh, essentially, what I'm going to do is give you some an idea of the, the uh, path of my uh, career on a particular topic in smoking cessation um, uh, uh, from, an, from a sort of high level overview today. So the policy that I want to talk about is something that was put out by the Joint Commission for the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or JACO, which is now wisely renamed itself as the Joint Commission. And this is the organization that accredits all hospitals. And so hospitals care about what's, what are the criteria. And around 1990, uh, JACO uh, required hospitals to have a policy about smoking. They didn't say it had to be a no smoking policy that you had to ban smoking everywhere. But this was happening at the time when um, there was a lot of uh, the institution of uh, policies that were banning smoking in public places, workplaces, restaurants, et cetera, things that we're used to now, but were very novel at that point. Um, although it didn't say what kind of policy you had, uh, the implication that people made was that you were supposed to ban smoking at least most of the places in the hospital. Uh, the rationale for this policy, as for other non-smoking policies, was to protect non-smokers, uh, of course, from the secondhand smoke consequences. But the unintended consequences of this policy, which, of course, we all know on policies have unintended consequences. And in this case, I've um, put unintended in 
quotes because I think we all knew that that really wasn't unintended. It was kind of intended, but uh, but it's not how we sold it. It's not how the si we used. That's not the scientific rationale for the policy, even though it would have this kind of good side effect, which was that it would reduce the opportunities for smokers to smoke. It eventually changed social norms about the acceptability of smoking. And as you know, it's led to a decrease in tobacco consumption and an increase in smoking cessation. So when this came out, um, I was a, a young physician who was interested in trying to um, figure out how we could work upstream in the healthcare set in the healthcare setting so that we weren't just taking care of the health consequences of tobacco use, but we were actually trying to prevent those consequences by um, avoiding, by, by helping people to stop smoking before they got sick. And um, my sense of this is that that was important that the healthcare system was a, a key channel for delivering um, tobacco cessation or tobacco treatment to the public. Um, and my thought about it was that there were these windows of opportunity that not only were we uh, were physicians um, uh, accepted and um, highly regarded uh, uh, advice givers on health matters, but we also had opportunities when people might be particularly likely to want to quit smoking. And I was particularly interested in hospital admission because of this policy. We already know and had some data at that point to show that Ill illness may motivate smokers to try to quit. So my thought was that if you were admitted to a hospital, that that might be a teachable moment because first of all, you were sick and sick enough to be in the hospital um, and it might be a tobacco related disease. It would probably be more powerful if it was, um, but that with this new policy, hospitals became smoke free. So whether you liked it or not, you were required to have temporary abstinence from your tobacco use. And you could perhaps reframe this as the beginning of a quit attempt. And that this is so that you could tell a smoker in the hospital that you don't really need to quit. You've already, you have quit. We, you just need to stay quit and avoid relapse. And perhaps that would help to um, initiate more cessation. Um, and so that raised the question of, could starting cessation treatment in the hospital improve rates after discharge? Um, and I got very excited when I saw an article in the, new, in the Annals of Internal Medicine that did a, did a wonderful uh, randomized trial that was done uh, by it, um, uh, at, uh, at Stanford uh, in the Bay Area of California. And uh, what they did was they randomized patients who were being admitted to a series of a group of hospitals with an acute myocardial infarction. Um, and they simply randomized them to get standard care, uh, which was probably advice to quit, and versus um, nurse counseling that that's happened in the hospital. It was about an hour long of, of counseling about why it's important to quit and how to do so. And then the nurse made three phone calls after discharge. And what was striking to me was that one year later, they had essentially doubled the quit rate uh, for bi with biochemically verified abstinence rates. I thought this was really impressive for something that sounded like a very uh, low cost and small intervention. Three years later, a different group of authors uh, did a cost effectiveness analysis of this and basically came to the conclusion that this was more effective than any other standard uh, secondary cardiac prevention interventions that we were doing at that time, which was largely beta blockers um, and nitroglycerin. Oops, Sorry. Um, pardon me. Uh, let's see. And so, the, the uh, editorial that went along with this um, said routine hospital based quit smoking treatment for post myocardial infarction patients, an idea whose time has come. I thought this was great. I was excited. I couldn't wait. Sadly, I waited. I waited. It didn't happen. Um, in the meantime, research continued, um, and people did continue to do these kinds of studies. And I was particularly interested in not just looking at the post-MI patient, but looking more broadly, I'm a general internist, across um, all hospital patients. And so the first uh, really serious piece of work I did on this area, in this area was to, to do a randomized trial of my own um, with uh, 650 smokers who were admitted to the medical and surgical services of Mass General Hospital, a large uh, teaching hospital in Boston where I work. And we, what we did there is we randomly assigned people who were admitted to medicine or surgery 
to either a chart prompt uh, in the paper chart, which we had in those days, to advise people to quit smoking. And then we had um, a trained counselor, not a nurse, but a trained counselor uh, who, with a bachelor's degree to come around and do 15 minutes of bedside counseling to motivate a cessation attempt and to then provide some uh, guidance on how to be successful. And then that person made one phone call with a week after discharge to help somebody to help the patient to remain on track. Uh, we did not use any pharmacotherapy at that time. This was the early 90s. And even nicotine replacement was relatively new. At that point, we actually measured it and only 4% of people were using any kind of nicotine replacement in the hospital. And um, we weren't really using it routinely after discharge. So this was purely a counseling intervention. And then we followed people one and six months after discharge. And this is what we found. We found that at a month, um, we, we had an effect. We increased the quit rates by about 10 percentage points. Um, at six months, however, that dis difference narrowed and uh, was no longer statistically significant. So our conclusion was that a low intensity program increased cessation rates for a month, but not long-term. And we obviously raised the, what seemed to be an obvious question to us, which is could a longer period of telephone contact after discharge extend the effect? Um, so the next step that, that happened uh, before we got around to actually doing the next step was that um, uh, the Cochrane Review decided to do an inter, uh, a systematic review with meta-analysis of interventions that began in the hospital so that, that we were framing it as not hospital only interventions, but hospitals that begin in, um, interventions that begin in the hospital and continue after discharge. Um, and so we did the first one in 2002. We then updated it in 2008 and 2012. Um, and I'm gonna show you here the 2012, just so that we don't get confused. I don't give you wrong information, but it, essentially what we're showing here was also what we said by 2002, the data just got better over time. Um, and I wanted to point out that 2012, which was the most recent uh, one was a long time ago now. And we are, recognizing that we're actually in the process of uh, re, re, uh, redoing it uh, now. In any case, what, the, what it said was that bedside counseling followed by telephone support for more than a month after discharge increased smoking cessation rates by 37%, which is a clinically meaningful increase uh, in our opinion. Uh, it was effective regardless of the reason for admission, although it was more effective in people with cardiovascular disease than in, in all admissions. It was not effective if you didn't have at least a month of continued support after discharge. And then starting NRT in the hospital increased quit rates by 50%, as well as relieving nicotine withdrawal symptoms. That was a conclusion that came only in 2012. It wasn't there in 2008 in 2002. And in 2012, we had 50 random, uh, randomized trials that had from all over the world that had shown this. So as a result of this, um, uh, we were able to convince our hospital uh, to uh, support a tobacco treatment service for hospital patients. It was an opt-out program that was offered to all hospital patients, not just those whose doctors decided that they might benefit from it. And it was really essentially three steps. It was routine. First, the first step was just identify who's the smoker. And this um, has become simpler with the advent of the electronic health record. And that is part of kind of the nursing admission information. The second step was that at the level of the hospital uh, itself, at the ho hospital floor itself, that the staff's responsibility was to give brief advice to quit and to order nicotine replacement to manage nicotine withdrawal symptoms in the hospital to, to prevent discomfort. And then the third step was we had a specially trained tobacco treatment, uh, tobacco treatment service counselor who went around and um, first made sure that people were comfortable and then encouraged the smoker to think about quitting smoking and help them to make a plan and then link the smoker to resources after discharge. This, this counselor was not a doctor, not a nurse, uh, but was a trained, um, a trained counselor, usually bachelor's degree, sometimes with a social work degree. So this is what we have done. It turned out to be not so complicated to do that, but the challenge we had was really this last piece was once 
we could do a lot in the hospital. It wasn't that hard to get it organized. But when people left the hospital, hospitals generally, their opinion is, you know, we're done after discharge, it's over. And, um, and we, it was hard to figure out how we could link the smoker to resources after discharge. So I'm gonna tell you about a series of studies that we've done uh, in the last 10 years to try to figure out how to solve this problem. I'd love to tell you that we've solved it and that at the end that you can just skip to the end and, and you'll have the answer, but we're still looking. But I wanna tell you a little bit about the, uh, the journey. So these are, uh, I, this is a timeline that shows you of a series of four trials that we've done. We call them the helping hand trials. Um, and uh, we did the, you can see that we've done four over the course of the last decade or a little more. And so let me take you through it. So all of them are very simple. They simply ask, how can we, the idea would be if you wanna get people to stay quit, you need to give them treatment. So how can we sustain treatment after discharge? And you have to do two things. As we know, there's two components to tobacco treatment. One is how can you keep people to using medicine and how can you keep people using counseling? So let's look at the first one. How do we sustain medication use after discharge? Well, you know, you need to remove the barriers that keep people from starting drug immediately. So what are those? Well, one is convenience. Um, normally what happens is you get a prescription on discharge and you have to go to the pharmacy and then you have to, you might have to pay for it because nicotine replacement over the counter is, uh, and even that, even with a prescription uh, was, has not always been well covered by insurance. And so, um, so our solution was let's give people um, a, a bag that has their, their medicine in hand at discharge. You don't, they don't have to go, they're sick, they're on their way home, they don't have to go to a pharmacy, their loved ones don't have to go to a pharmacy, let's just give them the medicine so they can keep taking it. And this has been shown to be an effective strategy for getting post MI patients to take uh, cholesterol lowering medicines and antihypertensives after discharge. Another way to uh, remove the barrier of cost is to give it for free. Um, the third was choice. Uh, we offered people any FDA approved medication, whatever they wanted to use, we were happy to give it to them as long as the uh, doctor in the hospital was willing to write a prescription for that particular medication. And then to remove barriers to a full course, what we decided to do was give people free refills for uh, up to 90 days of treatment. Um, and the reason, and that had the, the uh, I suppose, unintended consequence or intended consequence of they needed to stay in touch with us because if they wanted to get more medicine, they had to stay in touch with their treatment program. Okay, so that's the medicine. How do we sustain the counseling after discharge? Well. Um, it was unlikely that people were going to come back for in-person visits. Um, and what was cutting edge at that point was telephone calls. And telephone calls could do a lot. And that was actually what had been used in the original study that had inspired all this work, which, you know, the telephone calls could remind people to stay quit. They could offer ongoing counseling to help with relapse prevention or restart a quit attempt if someone had relapsed. They could encourage adherence to medication. So besides being technically counseling, they could also be kind of medicine management. Um, but they're labor intensive and expensive. And um, so our idea for sol solving this was to use automated phone calls using uh, interactive voice response technology or IVR for short, which at that point was very cutting edge stuff. We thought we were quite on the cutting edge. It's now everybody uses it and everybody knows about it, but the advantage is that you could triage patients needing a call from a counselor. And so um, you could, you know, figure out who wanted to really wanted to talk to somebody. And so this was more efficient than calls by a, uh, a live counselor. Also calls could be made outside working hours. Um, which is often an, a better way to reach people who are working. And um, there was low cost per call once the system is set up. Setting up the system is not necessarily so cheap, but once it's set up, the cost per call is very inexpensive. So that was our counseling strategy. And so we embarked on our first trial, which we called the Helping Hand One trial. Um, and I'm showing you the study design, um, which you will see this picture again in slightly different way uh, versions because frankly, all of our study designs for this randomized trial use 
use the same design. So in this one, we, ran, we um, enrolled about 400 people, uh, smokers admitted to Mass General with any diagnosis, who were smokers, who received cessation counseling in the hospital and uh, what plus or minus nicotine replacement. And we randomized them at discharge to either get standard care or sustained care, which was our intervention condition. And I'll explain that in a minute. I've kind of given you an idea of what it is. And then what we did is we measured outcomes by contacting people by phone at one, three, and six months. And our primary outcome measure was a tobacco abstinence at six months validated, um, uh, validated by cotinine or uh, expired air carbon monoxide. Uh, we also looked at other times, of other earlier points of tobacco abstinence. We also looked as our secondary or intermediate outcome was the use of tobacco treatment, both counseling and pharmacotherapy. And then finally, we did a cost effectiveness analysis. So uh, just to remind uh, or to reiterate what the interventions were, sustained care was 30 days of a free medicine of your choice, not just a prescription, refillable twice, uh, five automated IVR calls that were started three days after discharge. That was as early as we could. And we knew that people by three, uh, some early work I did found that 50% of smokers had already relapsed by three days after discharge. So you knew that we had to get them quickly. At each contact, the smoker is offered the option to ask for a counselor return call. And then some of the responses in the IVR would trigger an automatic call whether somebody wanted it or not. And those were things like, I didn't get my medication, um, I'm not using my medication, or I'm having a trouble with my medication. And then standard care, we wanted to, to give the same information, just not deliver it as, make it as easy to get. Um, and so each person, patient was given a specific medication recommendation in hand at discharge and given advice to call the state quit line. Uh, which offers free counseling and um, usually a sample of nicotine replacement. So we gave people information and, and told them how to get uh, what they needed for post-discharge care, but we didn't uh, sort of foist it upon them. Um, and the uh, patients that we enrolled were adult cigarette smokers who were admitted for any diagnosis. They were counseled by a hospital smoking counselor in the hospital, and they planned to try to quit smoking after discharge. We could have enrolled anybody, but we figured that to start with, we ought to start with people who at least were interested in trying to quit. Um, because this is a very low intensity intervention, it's a really a a no hand, a hands off intervention. Um, we thought that it was probably not appropriate for patients with serious substance use disorders or serious cognitive and psychiatric problems. And so um, we excluded those people. So as uh, you've seen before, we did enroll the smokers uh, over a two year period. Um, and we had good follow up assessment rates um, for uh, uh, up to six months a 2% mortality rate, um, but most important, there was no difference between the two groups in the, in the um, follow-up assessment rates, which um, avoided uh, bias. And our analysis was the standard intention to treat. And what was standard at the time was patients lost to follow-up was called, were uh, counted as, as smokers because we knew that they were not missing at random. Um, and we did, primary, we did require a biochemical validation. For those who, for people who claim to be non-smokers, uh, if you said you were a smoker, we believed you. Um, this was our baseline characteristics. It gives you an idea. All this is what we've gotten on, in our other samples. You basically get about people on average in their early fifties. They uh, smoke a, you know, a between a pack and a half and a, and uh, I mean almost a pack a day, and about half of them have a tobacco-related discharge diagnosis. So the first question is, if we're going to do an intervention, is did people actually get the intervention as implemented? And uh, what we found here was that it worked, that you know, almost two thirds of the IVR calls were answered, that almost, you know, almost everybody got the medication at discharge. And we found that even though we gave people choice of whatever they wanted, almost everybody took nicotine replacement, probably because they were started on that in the hospital and it made sense to continue. Um, and that half of them wanted medication refills. So we did have a, an engagement there. And then the uh, acceptability of the intervention was also high based on what patients told us at the end. Whoops, oh dear, I think I went all the way to the beginning. Oops, hold on a second. Uh, 
Pardon me. You'd think after all this time, I would know how to use Zoom a little better. Sorry. Okay. Let me get us into into the right mode. Okay. Um, so here's the results. So at, um, this is looking at one and three months after discharge in the intervention and control groups. And you can see that we more people use medication and more people use counseling. Um, uh, this is cumulative. Uh, so it's not a measure of how much of medication or how much counseling people got, but just what proportion of people got counseling. And it looked like, you know, we increased uh, uh, receipt of treatment, although you have you'd have to say that there was already a lot of medication use in the control group. And this was our tobacco abstinence results is that um, by self-report, uh, we showed a difference. And then uh, our primary outcome, which was at the end of six months was uh, we increased the, uh, the, uh, the quit rate by uh, uh, 71%. So that was good news. And we concluded that sustained care was better than standard care for this in this situation. We also did a cost effectiveness analysis, which I won't show you the details of. Um, and uh, we did a cost per quit and a cost per patient. And year one was expensive because of the cost of setting up the IVR system. But once it was set up, it was really quite cheap. And if you look at it from a cost per patient perspective, um, $108 per patient in uh, compared to the context of how much money it, how, how high hospital bills are, this is really peanuts. So we published our study and we were happy, uh, but we acknowledged that there were limitations, we weren't done. And one problem was it was a single site study. So would this generalize to other hospitals or was there something about um, our particular hospital? Um, and then the issue was also intervention scalability. How could this be done at scale? Uh, we did it in one place. Would it be sustainable after grant funding ended? And so that led us to the next trial, which we very imaginatively called the Helping Hand 2 trial. Um, and I began a collaboration with my colleague, Hilary Tyndall, who is now at Vanderbilt, was then at the University of Pittsburgh um, and has been a, a really valuable uh, colleague on all of this. So the interventions that we did, the innovations here were to test generalizability, we said, let's go to more hospitals. So uh, I recruited a small community hospital in our, um, in our, in a suburb of Boston. And then uh, Hillary joined us. Uh, and she was at that time at the University of Pittsburgh, which was a, a large academic center in another part of the country. Um, and we also broadened eligibility so that we enrolled patients with substance use disorders other than tobacco. We decided not to, not to exclude that group anymore. Um, and then to increase the scalability, what we did is we uh, wanted to reduce the cost. And to reduce the cost, we figured um, that we could do the in-hospital piece, but then what, and we, could, and we could probably figure out a way to pay for the medicines or at least 30 days of medicine, or maybe you could get it on somebody's um, insurance, but how could you do the counseling? And so our idea was, why don't we refer out to community-based resources that are free? And those, you know, those are quit lines, which are uh, available throughout the country. These are, as, as people know, that they're funded by state public health departments. They generally, what the services differ, but they generally add, uh, provide five proactive calls from a tobacco coach to a smoker co coordinated around the quit date. And they, most of them offer an NRT sample of maybe uh, two weeks, maybe four weeks, often eight weeks. Um, and um, so the idea that we had was um, that we would use the IVR call. And then if the patient requested or needed more help, what we would do is we would do a warm transfer and they, it would say, the IVR would say, just a moment, please, while we transfer your call. And then it would do a warm transfer over to the quitline coach and the quitline coach would then provide this, the um, services. So we thought that that way we would not lose people. Um, so we really thought we had streamlined our intervention delivery. So that's what we tested. Again, you've seen this something that looked like this before. This was the second trial. It was a larger trial, 1,350 uh, patients who were, got one or, or the other of these um, interventions, um, same, basically same outcomes. So this is what happened. Uh, our 
we found that we did, again, increase the use of treatment in up to three months, which is the length of the treatment that we offered. Um, and we did increase the uh, use of counseling, but you'll notice that the counseling rates are uh, quite a bit smaller than they were in the previous study. When we looked at abstinence rates, what we saw is that we did have an effect in self-reported abstinence at one, three, and six months. Um, although we lost our statistical significance at six months, the difference narrowed, and by six, and the, the, the confirmed uh, abstinence rates were no different. Obviously, this was a disappointment to us, and we had said, well, we had to figure out what we did wrong. So one thing we did was because Mass General had been, the same hospital had been in two different um, uh, uh, studies, what we did is we, we took the data from Mass General from the two studies and compared them to each other to see what, how they were different. So here, the red bars are the HH1 uh, intervention, and the blue bars are the HH2 uh, intervention and control. So at one month, um, the absence rates were really basically the same uh, between the two trials. But at six months, we had lost the, in, the effect of the, um, of the intervention. And um, the same was true with the confirmed abstinence rates. And then we looked at uh, medication and treatment, our intermediate outcomes. And we saw that the medication, again, it looked like, you know, kind of looked like we were still uh, getting the same effect. The difference was that very many fewer people were getting the counseling. Um, and that the counseling rate here in the intervention group was kind of what our control rate was in the, in the previous study. So clearly something went wrong. So we had to ask ourselves, as you always do when you have a randomized trial that doesn't work, uh, I guess the, the fir you first ask yourself, did you deliver the intervention as intended, which we have data, we had data to show that we had done that. Um, but then you have to say, well, well, what went wrong and what was different? And so we found that IVR acceptance was similar in both, in both of the studies uh, in, uh, so that it didn't seem like that was the problem. It wasn't that people stopped answering the phone and medication use was the same, but fewer people used the counseling. And it turned out when we did some qualitative work uh, that what had happened was the, 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 the idea of going from the IVR call to the quit line, while it sounded like a good idea, the ways quit lines worked uh, were that they, you first had to talk to somebody who asked you a bunch of questions to do an assessment, because that's what a counseling, the, the, the quit line needs to do to, to provide services. So you didn't go straight to a counselor. And, um, and plus, IVR calls were coming at unexpected times. And often people didn't have the, weren't in a situation where they could just kind of hang on the phone for and, and spend a bunch of time uh, doing the first call. So it turned out that our, our brilliant idea turned out to be not quite so brilliant. And uh, that the intervention really, our conclusion was that it was weakened by the modification we made to increase its scalability. So, okay, so we said, all right, we've got to figure out the next thing. Um, in the meantime, before, and I will tell you about that in a moment, in the meantime, uh, we had the opportunity to do a, a third trial in a slightly different setting, um, which was to look at patients who were hospitalized for psychiatric disorders. In other words, to, to see whether, um, well, first, uh, to see whether the intervention would be uh, applicable to a much more vulnerable population that we know smokes at very high rates and needs help. And we thought that this might be the opportunity to do that study. Because of time, I'm not going to go into uh, the details of this study, although I would be happy to talk about it afterwards and, um, and did send around a copy of the, uh, of the paper. Um, but this was just published this summer. So this was, we did this in one psychiatric hospital in Texas. I was working with Rick Brown from uh, uh, the UT Austin and we enrolled from a psychiatric hospital over a four year period. This just shows you the outcome measures of bio-verified uh, abstinence. And you can see that there was an effect, um, but uh, you have to pay attention to our, um, the scale of the y-axis here. You can see that these are actually quite low quit rates, not surprisingly, because generally speaking, patients with serious psychi uh, mental, mental illness um, do have more difficulty quitting, but we still found an effect to suggest that it was worth doing and are doing a cost-effectiveness analysis at this point to, um, 
uh, to get a better handle on it. I would say also that this was not exactly the same study in the sense because the the way we did the study is we um, the the intervention group got intervention in the hospital and after discharge. The control group got a much smaller intervention in the hospital. So we're really testing not just post discharge. We're really testing um, a hospital based hospital initiated intervention versus a less much less intensive intervention. Still, it gave us hope that there might be an, this is this might be another sort of teachable moment to. Uh, for a vulnerable population. Okay, so going back to the general hospital um, context, uh, we did the Helping Hand 4 trial, again, being incredibly imaginative about our acronyms, um, which I, thinking about it now, I sort of think about it as back to the future. Um, and so this is the, uh, the trial that we are just now analyzing the data. So I will show you uh, some preliminary uh, analyses and I'll describe what we did and then some preliminary analyses and happy to uh, e actually eager if you have any thoughts about what, other, what else we should do next. So uh, this was, a, we designed it as a comparative effectiveness trial um, because what we, we decided to do was we wanted to do, uh, go back to our original hospital-based intervention that had been effective. We said, okay, let's retreat back to what we know works and, um, and even update it a little bit. And the way that we updated it is that not only did we have IVR calls and a hospital-based counselor, but um, we saw it more as uh, the role of the counselor as being also a care manager and somebody who was in, would help to link the patient to their subsequent treatment as outpatients with their primary care physician so that, that this could, um, we could coordinate care and hopefully uh, that way continue to have smoking cessation treatment that lasted beyond the hospital by connecting into, um, into outpatient settings and that that was appropriate now that more and more we're working with accountable care organizations so that hospitals are part of are more tightly linked in to, uh, to the, the rest of the healthcare system. Uh, the other change we made is we only gave the op option of NRT because nicotine replacement is all that people were taking anyway. Um, and we gave them a little bit less to be a little bit more cost-effective, I suppose. Um, so that was the intervention. We sort of went back to it, but we wanted to, we really wanted to say, let's keep this within the healthcare system. Let's use the structure of the healthcare system that we have and try to try to um, piggyback onto the services that are uh, and the connections that are available and, and see what we can do. Um, and to compare that, we thought the, the, the alternative that has been um, is widely used is to use, is to refer people to quit lines, is to use a community-based intervention. Um, and quit line referrals have um, become more sophisticated uh, in the sense that um, it used to be that you would have to, uh, if you wanted to refer to a quit line, well, you can give the person a piece of paper and say, call this number. We know that that will uh, yield very few people to call. But then the second would be, you, we had uh, quit lines developed a fax referral capacity so that healthcare systems were faxing to quit lines. Um, and then the quit line counselor would call the patient proactively and say, you know, we received a, a, a call, you know, your, your physician um, referred you to us and so, and, and um, wanted to, us to help you to quit smoking. Would you like to have some help? So that was great. Um, and, uh, but, you know, faxing is very uh, last century now. And so what's been uh, developed uh, is now a closed loop electronic system that goes from the electronic health records to quit lines directly, a direct electronic connection, and then the staff will connect the smoker. And then the quit line will provide the counseling, will offer a nicotine replacement sample. And now most quit lines offer usually about a month of nicotine replacement, although it varies enormously from state to state. Um, and then what's cool about it is this bi-directionality that the referral outcome would come back into the electronic health record to complete the, the transfer of information so that presumably the next time the patient saw their physician, they could, the physician would have information about what had happened so that it would become kind of a, a nice smooth uh, provision of care. 
So these are the two leading contenders. Um, and the, uh, uh, from a hospital administrator perspective, um, the, the quit lines are very attractive because they're free, whereas the hospital-based interventions, you have to pay for somebody to do the counseling um, out of your budget. Um, our hypothesis was the hospital-based program would be more effective, but more costly. And we were really curious to see which would be more cost effective. So you've seen this picture before. Uh, here we are again. Um, it's a very similar pattern. What's different is we now have three hospitals. In a, we've added uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And um, the, I, I've more or less described what's in the, what we are now calling hospital tobacco care management versus the quitline e-referral. So we uh, enrolled 1,416 smokers um, over a two year period, ending very fortuitously hitting our target um, in mid-March, 2020, just as the hospitals all closed down for research uh, with COVID. Um, and our follow-up assessment rates were not quite as good as they had been 10 years before, um, but we still got pretty good rates and they didn't differ between the groups. Uh, got similar mortalities. The analysis again was similar. We did intention to treat, we did, but this time we did a multiple imputation um, for missing data uh, instead of making the more simple um, assumption of smoking equal, missing equals smoking. Um, and here's the baseline characteristics of our sample, which look very similar to the previous ones, although there are a smaller proportion of the patients that had tobacco related diseases. Um, and please note that this is a preliminary analysis. This is looking at use of treatment. And again, uh, it looked like we were able to provide, uh, we provided treatment more effectively to people uh, than the quit lines did, uh, the hospital-based intervention did. And the, that was also true for counseling and the counseling rates were much better than they had been in the second trial. This is our abstinence rates and you'll see that um, at one and three months by self-report, we uh, continued to have an effect, uh, but that effect narrowed and disappeared at six months and our biochemical verification uh, was not statistically significant. So our preliminary findings are that this hospital-based program, um, the internal version versus the external version, that the internal version was more effective for it only while treatment lasts and that the benefit declines after treatment ends. So from an implementation science lens, implementation would say, science would say, well, we know that treatment is associated with quitting. So really what we're trying to do is figure out what's the right strategy to get treatment into people's hands. If you look at it from that perspective, it was a successful trial. From a behavioral science lens, meaning did people actually quit? Uh, they're short-term, but not long-term. Um, and so, you know, what should we do now? Love to hear your thoughts. Should treatment last longer? Well, that's the obvious in, uh, kind of takeaway. Um, you know, should healthcare systems or quit, well, quit lines, uh, should we have uh, proactive monitoring and, and offers of treatment through the healthcare system on the outpatient side? Should you hook this treat, this, response to a teachable moment into something that already exists in health systems. Well, our health system at least doesn't have that. Um, and it, it is a reminder that tobacco use is a chronic relapsing disease that requires ongoing attention. Do we need a broader reach? Maybe what we really need, as I had said, was a health system or community-based intervention. Um, and then, you know, bringing it back to those of you who do policy, perhaps uh, what we really need is people are relapsing because of stress and other things going on, perhaps if we had stronger tobacco control policies, if tobacco taxes were higher, if there were other way, other things that um, made it even uh, more difficult um, to smoke, maybe, maybe stronger policies would help to keep people who had been able to stay off cigarettes for three months in, in response to an illness, uh, stay off permanently. So, um, so just some thoughts. Meanwhile, let's take the perspective of a hospital administrator um, because we did this with the idea that we wanted to give choices to hospital administrators so that they could um, pick the best way to, uh, 
or pick from choices. Um, so which strategy should they choose knowing this? Well, uh, the quit line is cheaper and it did produce a 21% self-reported quit rate at six months. Um, the caveat of course, is that this study had no control group. So uh, I can't really say for sure that they, we wouldn't have gotten a 21% quit rate with nothing beyond intervention in the hospital. The hospital care might be attractive, but only if it paid for itself. I mean, maybe it's attractive because we'd like to keep care within our system and we don't want people to, we don't want to lose our patients in our system. And so we'd like to keep, we try like to have comprehensive care. The challenge here uh, again becomes one, it's sort of a policy challenge, which is that you, in a fee-for-service environment, you can't bill insurers for telephone counseling and uh, also even per in-person services by non-clinician tobacco treatment specialists who are actually the people best at doing this um, are, is just not reimbursable. You can, uh, CMS will reimburse for doctors, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, sometimes social workers, uh, for doing this kind of work, but the tobacco treatment specialists aren't, ne but are, don't necessarily have those degrees, and people with those degrees are not necessarily. I don't. Not, I would not include social workers in this. People, the the doctors, the PhD, the the PhD clinicians, uh, are not the APP, uh, um, uh, the uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants aren't necessarily the right people with the best skills for doing this. So this could be changed. And frankly, is I think one of the challenges is that we have both for this specific problem, but in the larger sense of how can we make a better, do a better job of getting healthcare systems to support um, the smoking cessation. So um, I've now gone through uh, our, a 10 year experience for you of, you know, of the helping hand trials where we tested the initial model, we had success, we tried expanding and scaling it up. It didn't work quite so well as we had expected. We then moved and adapted to a more vulnerable population and then compared the two uh, best models that we had. And um, you've just heard where we are. So in summary, I'd say that hospital admission is a teachable moment for starting tobacco treatment. I think the evidence there is quite strong. Engaging smokers in counseling after discharge is the challenge, much more so than get, getting medicine into their hands. Um, and that late relapse is a barrier. It still is a barrier because tobacco use is a chronic disease and we have to figure out what we can do about that. Um, the real need I think is a coordinated cost-effective healthcare system-wide strategy, not just a piece here and a piece there. Um, to recognize tobacco use as a chronic disease, to use the tools of chronic disease management, and also to intervene it. So you do that all the time. And then you would, in addition, intervene at teachable moments such as hospitalization, but there are others. Uh, pregnancy is another classic one. So with that, I'm going to um, stop and, uh, and take any questions, but I wanna make sure to uh, thank the many members of the Helping Hand team. As anybody who's done randomized controlled trials knows, it is a work that requires many villages. These are some of our villages and I particularly wanted to call out Hillary Tyndall, Issa Davis and Rick Brown um, as my uh, very valued collaborators, as well as thanking all the tobacco counselors and the research staff at all these hospitals. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rigotti, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, let's invite our discussion today, Dr. Catherine McLean to see whether she has any questions and comments, Catherine. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rigotti. This was just really a fascinating talk and I, I learned so much. I don't have a ton of questions. Your studies are so well done, but I just had a couple of thoughts. Um, one, do you think that there might be any way to kind of engage with family members? I guess what I'm thinking is, um, you know, you're looking at the patient, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe if either the patient has a family member who is also a tobacco product user or could be a support system. Is there, if there is a family member, I'm thinking a partner, um, do you think that might be a way to keep engagement going, um, maybe through similar connections? 
I think that's a great idea. And in fact, I've, a number of people have been talking about it and are experimenting or piloting, I think, some of these ideas. I've heard it more in the, in the context of, of interventions in cancer centers, because there's been a big effort towards interventions in, can, in, in cancer centers. But um, so I think you could either have a non-smoker be the support person and or um, you could get other people in the family to quit because we know as I'm sure you do, that uh, that if you live with a smoker, you're much more likely to relapse. So that's a great idea. Thanks so much. Excited to see that work coming out. Um, I'm also wondering, might there be a role for uh, products like snus or e-cigarettes in some of these in the cessation or moving away from cigarettes in these in this question, or is that something you've thought about? Um, well, I. I certainly would think about it uh, and be interested in, in testing it. Um, I think that it, because physicians are, because we don't have any medically approved uh, e-cigarettes, it's gonna be a little bit uh, a tougher sell perhaps. Um, but I certainly think that, um, and I, I think it's gonna be, well, I'm thinking, well, you know, if you're going to continue it after discharge, does that mean we'd start e-cigarettes in the hospital? I know that in England, they've actually proposed doing that. Um, and there are some people in, uh, in the U.S. who also feel the same way. I think I'm feeling a little less that because we don't know so much about e-cigarettes, I'm not sure that uh, it's going to be a hard sell to get hospitals to be okay with 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 the uh, treating their patients with an unapproved FDA medication, uh, even if it has been a, not approved, but not taken off the market by the, by the, uh, the tobacco products folks. Um, but I do, I think for sure that some of these patients will need it. And perhaps that is an option. I think it will be challenging to get uh, research money to test it and, uh, um, and hospitals and, and physicians to, to do it. But I think that many of these patients have tried many times to quit and do eventually need uh, e-cigarettes. Great answer to a tough question. Um, I think that the, the use of the quit lines is really a, a very novel and creative way to get around some of these cost barriers. Are there any concerns that the use of the quit lines may crowd out other users or I, I know these Right now, you're at a smaller scale, but if you if we scaled up, would that be a concern, or do you think that the quit lines really are just not being utilized and got lots of space there? Um, yeah. So, so you're saying, is it just to make sure I understand your question? You're asking, is it possible? Do the quit lines have enough bandwidth to take yes. on more calls? Yeah. Um, and the actual, actually, the truth is that quit lines need more calls, um, generally speaking, that because. Um, the, the sources of calls for quit lines have either been when there are large communication campaigns like the TIPS program that comes out annually, but other than that, um, they, they don't reach more than one or 2% of the population. And so they've always looked to hospitals and you know, to healthcare systems as a great way to get business. Um, that said, you know, if I were a quit line vendor, uh, or if I were a state public health department, I could say, well, wait a minute, there are these private hospitals that I'm providing the ser free services to the patients from these private nonprofit, but still profitable hospitals. You know, maybe they should be paying something for, to me, for this service. I mean, in fact, what's happening is that the US taxpayers, all of us are paying for quit lines. And I think that's a good use of our tax dollars, but uh, you know, there could be other models. I know that in Massachusetts, that was brought up at one point some years ago. Um, needless to say, it was kind of dead on arrival. Very interesting. Um, I had another question. Is there any concern at all that, um, this is my last question because I want to leave um, questions for our, time for our audience, but is there any concern that uh, there may be some negative impacts on the patients from sort of the quitting at the time of the hospitalization. So I, that's what I'm thinking about is potentially psychiatric patients uh, where maybe this might be stressful for them. And do you have any thoughts on how to, to think about that question? If in fact, maybe this kind of strain uh, from 
the added removal of, uh, of nicotine during that hospital stay, how, that, how we might think about that part of care for patients. Well, often people are worried um, about worsening um, uh, psychiatric status with quitting, but actually the data tells us that you actually improve your psychiatric status when you quit. And if you're replacing the nicotine, you're probably going to be doing, you know, doing fine. Um, and so I don't think that that's so much of an issue. And in fact, most people who quit are very proud of it and very happy and, and are are motivated to want to do things. Now you could say, well, what about somebody who fails and doesn't that make it even harder for them to sort of be stable? I don't, I don't really think that, I think that the counseling can get around that because the way we, we phrase it is that, that, you know, this is like learning to ride a bicycle that you, you do fall off. And, and if you learn from your experience, then you'll keep going. And you've made us, even if you quit for you know, 24 hours, you've made a start you know, that's a great start. So if we can, if we frame it in the right way, I don't think it's going to be uh, a problem. Thanks so much. Uh, I have more questions, but I want to leave time for our audience. So just thanks so much for the great talk and the great questions and oh, answers. Sure. Thank you. So there are some questions from the audience. Uh, there are three related questions from Shadi Navi. And uh, the first question is, can you speak to the costs and the process involved in setting up the uh, bi-directional uh, EHR, the electronic uh, health record and quit line linkage, is sure. this something that's easily integrated into the system platforms? Yeah. And is there something that all various quit lines across the US have the capacity to do? I think that's a very okay, interesting. Okay, got it. That's a great question. Um, and uh, it's, it's, not ex it's not expensive in my experience, but what's hard is to get the, the, your electronic health record has to, the folks who run it have to be willing to make some changes, and it took um, it took me five years to get our hospital for for this request to get to the top of the priority list um, uh, for them to do this, and then the state uh, Department of Public Health also had to pay some extra to the vendor in order to get this to happen for our our particular place. So it it is. It's feasible, but it has it is um, fr it's fraught with with barriers that often have more to do with uh, engaging um, important stakeholders to say this is important enough that we want to do this. Um, it's it, I don't think the cost is much, and, and once it's set up, I think it's it's quite free. There are a lot of concerns around privacy and uh, information going outside the hospital with HIPAA protected information, and there the there's a nice way around it. And there's actually a very nice paper that Hillary Tyndall wrote in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine a couple of years ago, where she described this process and um, how it had been worked at. Um, uh, in um, at the University of Pittsburgh, I believe. Thank you. So it's, it's it's easier said than done, but it's <laughs> but the, I think that that's where we're going with quit lines, and so um, yeah. <laughs> yes, and um, uh, some question regarding um, any new thoughts about scaling up the intervention, such as to primary care. Well, um, what. What we try, um, you mean scaling like the post-discharge intervention off to primary care? Do you think that's what the, the question that's is? What, that's what I think the audience wants yeah. to know. Okay, so well, what we tried to do, and I, I didn't uh, go into this level of detail, and I probably should have, was that we um, took people who were, we, we our, our counselor, when they finished six, three months of treatment, what we then did is we contacted the primary care doctor who, of the patient, and we sent them information through the electronic health record to say, here's what your patient has received in the last three months, here's what their current status is, here's what we recommend is your next step, and we sent that off. Um, and um, I, it, we haven't analyzed the data to see how much patients had a sense that this actually made any difference. I, I think that physicians at this point are um, inundated by their in baskets filled with these kinds of notes of things that they should do if they had time. So I think we, we need to figure out how they could do it. I personally think that, um, that actually the best way a healthcare system should do with tobacco, deal with tobacco treatment is to have um, a, ser a, a service that kind of manages it for everybody and then triages back to the, the primary care doctor when they need something. Um, 
and and I found that in when I when I've in our system when we've had the resources to do that, it's been very popular. Thank you. I think we have time for the, uh, one last uh, Q and A. So this is from Ken Warner. What are your thoughts on the tailored online cessation programs? They have the ability to follow up with individuals frequently with advice and feedback tailored to each individual's concerns about smoking. Um, have you considered using them for follow-up to the hospital care? Um, I think that's a great idea. I think that, that you know, we are using something, you know, technologies move quickly in the last 10 years. And uh, what was novel once upon a time is we're a little outdated. So I think that those kinds of things um, are a great idea. Thank you, Dr. Rigotti. I think we're about time. Um, please take away Mike to summarize um, this great presentation. Thanks. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to our audience of 185 people for your participation. Have a top snatch weekend.